Okay, today we're going to answer a number of questions that you've posed for me. I looked over some of them last night. This morning when I got up, I'm just, I hadn't read anything that's shown up since then, but I'm going to just answer whatever I see. So the question was, as the semester starts again, I said, I'm going to punt on the live Q&A, but I will try to answer your hardest questions. So what I wanted to get you to talk about, and you guys were kind of all over the map, and that's okay. But my question was, how do you answer skeptics and trolls? What questions do you see that you'd like me to address? And some of you wandered off that. Some of you stayed on that and some wandered off the reservation. But they were all good questions from what I saw. Okay, so I have 38 comments here. I had one of those IBM PCs as a kid. Now, they're talking about this. It had nothing to do with it. But yeah, I had something like this. It was like a PC either AT or an XT, I don't remember with, which with floppy drives and not much memory and uh, dot matrix printer and that kind of thing. The, the meme I put here was internet tough guy. It's easy to be a six foot Olympic power lifter, uh, power lifter and street fighter god from behind the confines of a keyboard. Yeah, that's how trolls operate. So that's why I put the meme there. Okay. Anyway, uh, 71 charger 313. At 318 said I had one of those IBM PCs as a kid. I think all you can do to counter trolls is fact check them, or in some cases, uh, no answer is an answer. That's actually a really good answer. I have found that when they say, um, you know, just common talking points, I say, well, that's interesting. Uh, can you provide the link to a video about that? They never do. Or uh, they'll say something and I'll say, okay, well, uh, they'll say, you can't trust the, the mainstream media. Okay. Who do you rely on? And they never answer me. Like, who do you trust? Who, who should I read if I can't trust that? And they never answer. It said silence sometimes is more mentally excruciating and discrediting to your opponent than a response to them, just leaving them to hang out there awkwardly. Plenty of examples of that throughout history. I would think Musashi's strategies in the Book of Five Rings could be applied here to combat the information warfare tactics of, of bots and, and he goes on, and trolls. Okay, so Musashi's strategy. Book of five. Here's the Book of Five Rings. I never liked this book. I read it, but I like the summaries of it because it's actually really good thinking about. So it, you, you'd be better, rather than reading the actual book itself, it would be better for you to read a summary, like a Wikipedia summary of it. But props to you for, for invoking Musashi and what he had to say. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we need to think in those terms. Sometimes it's just better to leave things unanswered. Like, just let it, let it hang there. Uh, and, and I do that whenever I'm feeling like emotionally provoked. Like, what do you mean I'm not a real professor and I have no job? I'm like, I'm like okay, I'm leaving that alone. Because I felt the emotion that was assigned to me to leave it alone. Okay, I am a professor. I do have a job. I, he was just trying to, you know, turn the, turn the screws or, or get under my skin. I don't know if it's possible, but since you're a professor, maybe interview a fellow professor from Ukraine. That's a good idea. I was at the conference back in October last year. I was giving a paper on Zelensky as a uh, transformational, empowering, and, uh, and uh, servant leader. And we're looking at the first hundred days of Zelensky's uh, since the invasion and how he hit the bill of those three subcategories. Those are very specific subcategories of leadership, like transformational leadership. The four eyes of transformational leadership uh, are like we could we could actually look at it academically and dissect whether Zelensky was doing or not doing these things. Um, and uh, so this Ukrainian professor came to. That session, and then I spent the next couple of days hanging out with him. Uh, and it's like, hey, look, if I said anything wrong, you know, show me what where I'm going wrong. He's like, no, no, you're right on track. Uh, and I just I got to unpack all my assumptions about what was what I saw going on, and uh, he verified that I was on track. Now, of course, there's not all Ukrainians are monolithic, but I think he spoke for the general voice of Ukraine that. You know, what's going on in with Russia invading them is not a positive thing. Okay. Uh, always be aware that there is more people reading troll stuff and your replies. So make sure that you put them in their place with facts and humor. 
that always wins an audience for you. Yeah, so I'm aware of that, and that's why sometimes I don't like to let it go unanswered, but sometimes I need to. But what I do with that is it's not so much humor, although sometimes I get suckered into that, but the facts of, well, okay, you mentioned uh, the Bud- uh, the um, uh, Minsk and Minsk II. Well, have you considered the Budapest Memorandum? Because once Russia violates the Budapest Memorandum, do, do, the, do these other things really matter? Like Russia was supposed to be a guarantor of these rights. And I'll ask that. Or um, all our, I'll ask for facts like, well, can you tell me more about this? Or can you cite that? And generally, I like to ask them to cite their sources, not just provide assertions. Okay. I don't know, but I bet uh, that was a pretty op set up in, the, in his day talking about the picture. Uh, greetings from Utah, Professor. That's uh, that's a good one. And most trolls and bots are just that computer warriors. That's exactly right. That's that's where they tend to be. Um, so how do you answer with hard evidential facts and sarcasm? Works for me. Yeah, I try to limit the sarcasm because I, I just don't I, I don't find and I like sarcasm, um, but I just don't find it to be helpful as much as just asking. Well, can you provide a link about that? And they never do. Um, okay. Uh, today in response to commander Nielsen's latest uh, video, I had a hard look at the Ukrainian progress so far quoted before, uh, but quoted below. And he goes on and he talks about a lot that happened here in Ukraine. I read this, uh, over this last night. Um, and I'm not going to repeat everything here right now. Um, but he's given a pretty comprehensive view in, in this. And uh, you can read this on the community tab. But he, he gets to the end. He says, "My understanding is that F-16s, which would, which, uh, which would be, which would be, or will be provided, are likely to have better radar and tech, uh, targeting capability than any existing Ukrainian aircraft, and also offer the capability to use a wide range of munitions, which Western partners are in position to provide in reasonably large quantities." At present, Putin's regime air forces are reluctant to come too close to Ukrainian-controlled territory because it places their air assets in peril. Uh, even if a handful of F-16s could improve this dynamic and push back the safe operational range for Putin's air forces, this is effectively what you are saying when you note that even a small number of F-16s would improve uh, Ukrainian air defense, even though it would not be sufficient for close air support. The point is that these marginal benefits from F-16s could not only make Ukrainian cities safer from orc air attacks, but also reduce orc air attacks on the frontline troops by discouraging orc air units from operating close to the Ukrainian controlled airspace. While the benefit to the ground forces from this effect might not be on the scale of Desert Storm style air campaign, it would arguably be something. Okay, I want to talk about that last paragraph there. Um, because, yeah, like the Russian Air Force doesn't tend to spend a lot of time in Ukrainian airspace. They tend to hide from hundreds of miles behind the lines firing a missile, and that's about all that they do. So they're not really playing havoc with frontline troops, um, and uh, but they are using that to send rockets to you know hit a residential complex somewhere in a major city. Uh, as for F-16, somebody talked about the difference, and I don't think it was this one. Um, it it might have been a different question, and when we get to it, we'll get to it. Why F-16s and not F-18s? And, well, you know, are F-18s better or whatever? But we have lots of F-16s, and because we have a lot, we can actually be sh- sure of supply and training and whatever form. And we're not training a whole lot of F-16 pilots even even yet. It's only... Uh, it's a very small um, a number. It's not like hundreds. It's not even, I don't think, dozens. It's very few. Uh, but something's better than nothing, and we got to keep moving that direction. And somebody else was asking about like the, the progress of what we're giving, and I'll, I'll, I'll hold my comments on that for later. Okay, most skeptics and trolls are looking for attention. That, that's exactly right. They're looking for attention one way or another. Now, there's a difference between a skeptic who just yeah, I don't know that we can trust it, and a troll who's really trying to undermine you. Or your material is pro-Ukraine and a troll is a subhuman that works on the fifth floor of a cubicle in the Wagner headquarters in St. Petersburg. And that could be that, that that troll is really just, you know, trying to undermine with everything that they say because they're getting paid for it. 
take it easy on them with the value of the ruble. They're basically working for dollar eighteen an hour compared to U.S. currency. Love the now. That's a really interesting insight given what we know about what happened to the uh, the ruble over in in recent time, where it's it's actually hit uh, one hundredth of of the U.S. dollar um, recently, and it wasn't at parity when it started, but it's it's psychologically there's a there's a weird dynamic there. Okay, the right answers for skeptics, trolls, professors, and laypersons are exactly the same. Humility, honesty, intellectual integrity. Not to be able to respond to those is defeat, admit it or not. Um, while I like sarcasm, while I want to ridicule my opponent, I also I have to bring myself to a point to you say, like, how would I want to be treated here? Like, there's a, there's a great book that I use in one of my classes called everyone matters and or everybody matters is uh by a businessman who he, he's at a wedding and he is he's um you know the bride and groom are are about to get married and um the minister says who gives this uh, woman away and uh the father says her mother and i do and you know he's just, like the father the author says you know the father's thinking you know look look son this this is my daughter and you better treat her right. You know, I raised her for 20 years so that she could be, uh, you know, have all the love and protection, whatever, going into this marriage. And you better make sure, like, that's what he's really thinking. And and he had a kind of a revelatory moment where he said, like, you know, everybody that works for me is somebody's precious son or daughter. And what would happen if we treated them that way? And I think we want to extend that from just the business context to that analogy where we start thinking about other people. How should we treat other people? And I get it. Like, you know, you're, you, I, I see the language here of, of orcs and I understand the dehumanizing language with that, but not, it's hard to separate who's the real troll from who is like a real skeptic, who's just somebody's precious child who is misinformed. And, and you, you have to think about this. I think more of as a POW rescue mission to reclaim that person's mind and bring them back over to the right side, really than just um, letting off steam and just pummeling them with your uh, caustic remarks. I don't, I don't know that, that that helps to do that, but if you can give them food for thought and draw them back over to the other side, if you bring them over to your side, you will have won. And I don't think you win by arguing them in. I think you win by showing them a comparison and saying like, you know, okay, who's the bad guy? The guy that, you know, blows up buildings and children and hospitals or the guy that's defending their women and children in their own land, right? I mean, what, I'm just bringing them to asking them these kinds of questions. Okay, let me keep going. Uh, why does the West deliver weapons so slowly and never enough? That's a great question. I'm going to, I'm going to read the whole in and answer it. Uh, why doesn't the West go all in with weapon delivery? Why were there no significant orders placed yet as the big, uh, the big weapons industry, as far as I know, these are the key questions, unfortunately, and the toughest ones that I heard recently in a video by military and history, Thorstein Heinrich, he did a summarized video in the dark, depressing questions that I've been thinking for far uh, to for, for quite a while. Uh, I can't, hold on, I can't come up with a definitive answer, but I'd love to know your take on these. Okay, so I was reading, it, it, it's good timing that you asked me that, because I've wondered that for a while too. Yesterday, I read an article, uh, an interview with Ann Applebaum, and she was talking about the West is all in. You can see that the West is all in by how gradual they are in their approach. And I thought, hmm, that's really an interesting way of describing that. Because <clears throat> I've been somewhat critical of them. Like, yeah, <clears throat> you know, you, you should have given them, you, you've you let Putin deter you for too long. And, and really they have, Putin has deterred the West for too long. But her argument was the same as mine, but a flip reverse angle look at it. They're all in. And they're not just giving a bunch of stuff that could fall into the wrong hands. They're giving what they can as measured as possible, little by little, and testing the waters and moving incrementally in order to get them what they can handle at a particular time with trying to meet the same needs that they have. And um, it's 
I don't want to say like a parent does with a child because that, it's not a good analogy. Like, because Ukraine's not a child and the U.S. is not a parent. But just abide with me for a moment and and just just hear the analogy. What I'm trying to do with my children is I'm trying to give incremental responsibility that they can handle so that they, they can grow into it and and be able to use it appropriately. And it's a terrible analogy because of parent and child, but that's kind of what is being done because you don't want things to just get destroyed. You want them to be able to use it effectively. Now, the, this is complicated by the fact that Ukraine didn't have a military for years and didn't feel like it needed a military for years. And that that is a legitimate thought, right? I mean, from the Budapest Memorandum, they weren't supposed to need that. They had guarantees from the US, Russia, and the UK. So this is very new. Um, from 2014, they've been growing, and they've been growing significantly in their capabilities, but you're trying to get that. You're trying to also balance what capabilities they don't want to provide because they're trying to not trip the wire with Russia about nuclear weapons. So they're being maybe too conservative with that, too careful with it. And um, I think that's a legitimate piece of that puzzle as well. But your fear, <clears throat> your fear seems predicated on the thing, the idea that, well, why are they being so slow? I think they're going as fast as they feel that they can while weighing all the factors. And they're all in and they're the way that they're doing it shows that they are all in and that actually is very comforting i don't know if i explained that very well but they they have they have been very measured and it's, i'll give you another example it's also a parenting example that um i, I think adds more illustration my oldest daughter will sometimes um uh, say, well, why can't I just do this? Or why can't I just do that? Like, look, <clears throat> this is hard for me too. If I didn't actually love you, I would just be like, go do whatever you want. Harm yourself. It doesn't matter. I mean, I would not harm yourself, but like go have all the freedom that you want and run off into a ditch. No, get into a car accident, stay out all night, whatever it is. I don't do that. I have these certain restraints in place because I actually do care. And because I do care, I, I, I give certain, only certain, as much as, I give as much um, uh, reach as I can give her, or uh, leash is the wrong word. <laughs> that sounds terrible. I give her as much latitude as I can give her, where I'm confident that she is able to use it wisely. I don't give her all of it, because I don't want her to, you know, make some bad choices that, right, I, I, and it's incremental. And it's different at age 17 that it is at age seven, right? And it's expanding over time and getting more and more, but I have to try to measure it appropriately. And I think that's what the administration is trying to do. But I think they've also been too conservative because of, out of fear for Putin, but they're still trying to do the right thing. Okay. At any rate, uh, let's move on to the next one. Vlad Vexler just did a video about some far alt left uh, getting the war and the entire conflict wrong. Would be interested in your perspective, including similarities or differences to people on the far alt right who are supporting Russia. Um, I think the language, so I watched that video and thank you for raising it. Lawrence, 1973. Uh, I watched that video and I thought this was one of Vlad Vexler's very best videos. Uh, it's certainly in the top three or four of his videos in my mind. So if you have a chance to watch it, I highly recommend it. It, he was speaking to the left, um, I don't, I, I don't know what his political sensibilities are. I think he leans far more to, well, everybody leans more left than I do. I mean, <laughs> but I wouldn't have made that kind of video and talked about those kind of characters because coming from the right, it looks like a criticism. I have criticized those on the far right for very similar kinds of things because I'm a conservative. So I'm, I'm talking about people on the right-hand side of the spectrum. It's, it's a lot easier for me to see them more clearly. And it doesn't look like I'm just chastising the opposition. Um, but it's a great video. He's right. They get, they get it wrong because they take Putin at his word, talking about, well, I just needed this security and not, not recognizing that 
Putin is just a um, a dark human who will just keep going. And he one of the things that he does really well in that video, he makes a distinction between like it's American imperialism, imperialism, and Russian imperialism. Russian imperialism is all bad. The American form of like where like okay, let's let's do it like this. Dennis Prager, and you might not know who Dennis Prager is. He's on the right side of the spectrum. He talks about and I've heard this from other people as well. Like if you're in a dark alley and um, you're walking home at night, you're in a dark alley, it's kind of spooky, and then you hear footsteps behind you, right? Are you are you more or less um, concerned when you realize that the, the, the footsteps that you heard were from a group of six or seven men who now they're carrying Bibles and just came from a Bible study? Well, of course, you, you, I mean, you're, you're less concerned. They carry in Bibles. They came from a Bible study. That's not the demographic that's likely going to, um, you know, want to mug you. Okay. So I say that to say this, like there's imperialism and there's imperialism. Like Putin's imperialism is all bad. American imperialism is, is generally, I don't want to say benign because depending on where you are in the world, you might not like it. But like, if you are going to be under somebody's imperialism, you you don't want the Nazis, you don't want the Russians, you didn't want the imperial Japanese. The Americans were actually a pretty good deal most of the time. Now, if you're on the wrong side of that, staring down the U.S. military, I'm sure you didn't like it, right? Like, and there are some people that are just. I hate America, right or wrong, that would always say that's bad. But generally, they've been a positive force in many places in the world. Not completely, I'm not saying my country right or wrong, but compared to the imperialism of Russia, it's there's no contest. It's, it, it's, of, a, it's of a different kind um, than what the Russian uh, imperialistic project is. Um, trying to... Now, they may have gotten it wrong with trying to uh, spread democracy or whatever. I mean, maybe that just isn't going to work in some, some places. I, I don't know, but they're, they're trying to do something very different than what the Russians are doing. At any rate, that was a great video by Vlad and I would highly recommend it. Okay. Next question. You'll answer our hardest questions. How about this? After all their collective years of experience, why can't women make babies consistently? They all come out d different. I never been a, on the production floor that would tolerate this kind of inconsistency. I certainly wouldn't accept that kind of inconsistency from Macy's Nors from Amazon. Well, what's going on here? Um, so I have six kids. They're all different, and um, I, I think that's the way that God made us, so that we'd have variation in it. I think that's a that variation is a good thing, so that we're all not like each other. Um, so I don't see a problem with it, but I'd like to talk about stuff about Ukraine. So let's go on to the next one. I'm watching you for, uh, I, I am waiting for you to cover both siders and equal waiters. You have yet to do so. Yeah, I don't spend a lot of time with the both siders. I don't find them nearly as informative. I find the, the contrast between the two to tell me more about what's going on. I find them more dangerous than pro-Russian sources as the impartiality is more convincing for people. Uh, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. The two examples are Willie OAM and Thorsten of Military History. Hoping you'll cover soon. I, I don't really like the two the the both sider types. Um, I suppose you can look at at Ukraine and just cover what is happening without having a moral stance. But I, it's hard to put away the the moral indignity of you know what one side is doing to the other i mean the the um it, it's just i i, I don't I, I would have a hard time trying to neutrally examine just what's happening now you can do that um militarily but as far as the geopolitical type analysis that that's a whole different uh ball of wax you're not just counting bodies you're you're trying to again my my whole everything I'm trying to do is to provide you context. So if I limit my context by trying to be neutral, I've, I've neutered the context and that's, 
yeah, I, I just don't like it. I actually appreciate, and this is why I look at RT, then Pravda, then TAS, because TAS is a little bit better than Pravda, which is a little bit, it's Pravda's nuts. And TAS is kind of nuts, and it's state-sponsored it's state -sponsored lies. But, uh, but RT tends to be one of the nuttier ones, and so you see more of what they're trying to say. And even though it is even further wrong, it's magnified it to, to help me see what Russia's trying to say. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's, that's why I don't spend any time with these guys. Okay, um, trolls don't care about questions or... The true, they only care about one thing. Have you got a washing machine? Yeah, they only care. I mean, real trolls don't only care about getting their troll points across. How does the Western world begin to factually inform Russian population of the truth and the error of their current thinking? It seems an impossible task. Thanks for asking, NP. NP is, I've called myself a nerdy professor in one of the videos, and M.O. Hardin has called me NP ever since, which, you know, I mean, I am kind of a nerd. Okay, how does the Western world begin to factually inform the Russian population? It's hard because, and Russia knew that this was a problem, which is why they turned off the internet to the world, right? I mean, in Russia, you can, without a VPN, you can only get um, certain information. You can't actually get the kinds of things that I'm talking about. And they've done that on purpose because they're trying to keep their population only singing from their song sheet, not being able to compare the rest of the world. and. Um, that, that itself tells me who's, who's wrong on this, in this engagement. If you could just take that one fact and say, okay, you want to throw, throw in your lot on the side that will allow every, you to hear everyone's opinions or throw in your lot on the side that will only tell you their side of the story. Who do you think is the, or where would you want to place yourself? Okay. Uh, don't attack me like this. I, I'm. I am sorry. Uh, that's I think that's the count from Sesame Street in the picture here. I'm sorry, count. I I didn't mean to attack you. I'm very very sorry. Um, the general rule on the internet is don't feed the trolls, and that's that's generally good advice. It's it's hard to determine who's a troll, but with certain trolls, you hear the same talking points. It's almost laughable how many times you hear the certain talking points. So, and then he goes on and talks about the computer setup here. So I'm going to skip the computer setup discussion. Um, he said, I think the most important question is how we can get political leadership in NATO to focus on a joint strategy to help Ukraine win the war and defeat Russia. Let's provide military support to reach this goal quickly rather than allow Russia to adjust sanctions and become more of a problem. Yeah, I think both the Ukrainians, well, no, not both, all the Ukrainians, the Russians and the West are now getting to understand that this is going to be a long war. I, I have said. I don't think this will be done like at, Chris, at Christmas, New Year's. I said, I think we're going to be here next next New Year's. It might be longer than than that, too. It's, I think it's going to be longer than any of us want it to be. And um, short of a major military breakthrough, and they're not getting the frustration is that they're, they don't have the right tools in order to um, in order to get where they need to go. I give an example in class where um, it's a teamwork example, and I, uh, I'm trying to draw a point here. So I give out a hammer. I give out uh, something to cut with. I used to give a saw, and then I was like, that's dangerous. So I give this like toy lightsaber and say, like, that's to cut with, right? And then I give a, a level, a wrench, and a screwdriver. And, I, and I, I hand them to five different students. I say, okay, on a scale of one to ten, how well does the hammer hammer things? A 10. Yeah. Okay. How well does the hammer cut? Well, a zero. No, no, no. You can cut through that board with a hammer. You're just going it, to, it, you're going to chop it and you'll break that board, but it's going to be really ugly. So maybe a two. How well can the hammer wrench things? Well, I mean, it's got the cat's claw on the back of it. So it can, it can probably, you know, if it can latch on, it can pull things out. Maybe it's a two. Okay. So the point of that was that the, you use the hammer to to hammer, you use the saw to cut things, you use the wrench to wrench things, you use the level to level things, as opposed to each of you do every every bit of your project and then slap it together. No, send one student to research, send one student to write, one student to edit, one student to do this or the presentation or whatever else, right? If you do that, then everybody can sing their high notes. Okay, 
So in the same way, we have not equipped the Ukrainian army with the correct tools. Like, so they have these huge minefields, but they don't have enough mining equipment and they don't have the air power to overcome. And be, you, you can't just send tanks. You have to have the air power to clear so that the tanks can come through. So it's like the hammer. We've given them hammers, but now they're using the hammer to cut through the boards when they need a saw to cut through a board, right? So, uh, so they have certain things, but they don't necessarily have the correct tools and that's a problem and that's leading to a longer engagement. Um, now, I have to go back to the parent-child analogy. Are they ready for whatever the next tool is that would be the appropriate tool for that? And I'm sure somewhere somebody in Washington is making that judgment call trying to do that, but I, it, it's a tough scenario all the way around. Okay, let's keep going. Speaking of skeptics, I'm skeptical that the picture of, on his monitor isn't a Photoshop. That's not the point, but you're probably right. Um Let's see. Uh, he keeps going on about the picture. Right here, right now, Fat Boy Slim. I don't understand that. If you could put in the comments what that is, because I was hearing, hearing the other song, the Jesus Jones song, right here, right now. And I don't know that there's a connection to that either, but that's the one that comes to my mind. Okay. At any rate, um, I like and I still think that there should be a demilitarized zone when Ukraine wins on the Russian side of the land. Thank you, Eddie Goodman. Um, so. What you keep hearing from Russia is, well, you know, we're, we can't c concede to Zelensky. We, I mean, our our requirements are that it, uh, those new oblasts are, are all part of Russia and forever will be. Really, that's a that's not a legit legitimate negotiating position. The Ukrainians should be saying, you know what, when we win, we're taking all the oblasts around the Crimea, everything around that, all the way down to have a buffer zone of a neutral land between Russia, which has proven itself to be aggressive, and Ukraine. So not only are we getting Ukraine back, we're getting that too. That, that's how you would negotiate so that you get actually just Ukraine back. Um, but they're not talking about that kind of thing at all. And I get it, you know, t dealing with a nuclear armed Russia. But, you know, the nuclear arms, somebody else brought something up about that, and I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. They can't use them. Like they really can't. Well, I'm I'm getting ahead of myself, but um, yeah. Why should Ukraine be the only ones to give things up? They're the victims, and it's like you you just broke into my house and stole my jewelry and my TV, and and they want to say, well, I I should get to keep the stuff. I mean, finders keepers, after all. No, <laughs> you should not only not get to keep the stuff, you should go to jail and pay the price for that. That's that's ridiculous. Okay. Um, let's keep going. My oppositional defiant or disorder makes it so that I have to determine their motivation and skewer it. If the troll says that Ukraine is losing it, uh, losing, it's because they want you to think, uh, we shouldn't be wasting money on military aid. And so I respond that if Ukraine is losing, then I better talk to my congressman and <laughs> demand that they increase military aid that, you know, actually checks, checks rice. That is such a great point. The way that you're analyzing this is wonderful. A plus, so you get the gold star for this. Um, because if the troll says that they're losing, when you hear Russian trolls, Russian repeaters say Ukraine is losing, why are they saying it? <laughs> yeah, they, uh, Ukraine shouldn't waste this money. Hmm. Maybe they're worried about you, uh, this money being spent on Ukraine. Maybe they're worried that they're... You can't just say that. I, I saw these uh, articles in... Uh, Pravda, I did a video about this actually, uh, in Pravda and RT talking about Ukraine has lost the counteroffensive. You can't just declare that. It, the counteroffensive isn't lost until the your counterparty has given up and you know they just can't fight anymore. You you can't just say they have lost. It it, you, it doesn't doesn't work that way. You'll notice that I took to putting pressure on the people who are the ones that make it happen rather than just state an opinion that goes nowhere. Uh, which is much, much worse to the paid trolls when I make it clear that their trolling is having exactly the opposite effect that they are being paid to have and is spurring me to action, which might uh, not hap have happened if, for, if not for their trolling. The message to them is to stop trolling because it's backfiring. Yeah, so, so that for the unpaid trolls, I think that that might be the case. For paid trolls, um, you know, I used to have a sign down here at the bottom of my screen uh, that, that said... Uh, uh, trolls are being laid off or something like that, uh, like to uh, give them their jobs back or something. And people didn't quite understand, but it was along the lines of what you were saying. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, there's that, but there's a difference between paid trolls who just don't care and unpaid who are actually caring enough to read or watch this kind of stuff and then argue with me. And for them, I think you'll have an effect on them when you do something like that. All right. So given my ignorance of political affairs, I don't know if it's a question that you'll find relevant for this particular moment, but it's been burning in the back of my mind since the full scale invasion of Russia of Ukraine by Russia. In case you wonder, the lower case is not my mistake. It's purposeful because I'm mad. I have to say I'm not Ukrainian nor Russian, the lowercase in Russian. And by the way, they started doing that in, uh, at, at, at universities in, um, in uh, Ukraine and professors are like, I'm not going to correct that. That's, that seems appropriate. Um, I read a funny article about that kind of thing. I, I'm not Ukrainian nor Russian either. Uh, I'm just an American who this is, these are my values that I, I'm upholding by supporting Ukraine. Okay. The following is context and you may skip it. I imagine you're already likely aware. And they talk about how Russia is part of the UN Security Council. Ukraine is a member of the UN. The UN Security Council is supposed to uphold the international peace and security. And he goes on and on here about, and you can read this. I'm, I'm just going to kind of summarize what he says. Like, why are we allowing Russia? Like, this is long. Look at this. This is long, article this, article that, and all the way through. Uh, and then I found this. And okay, so, but the question they got down to, and I read all that last night, was uh, but why still hasn't Russia been demoted? Isn't that the correct term from the UN Security Council? Okay, so there's two dynamics at play that are really relevant here. Um, when, okay, so Russia, one member, is beating up on another member. Why are they still on the Security Council? Is the broader question, if I can very simply summarize it. And if I'm not doing justice to, to your question, I, I'm very, very sorry. So Vlad, <clears throat> Vlad Vexler made a fascinating case, and I think he's right, about the, the United Nations. And that is that the UN is strongest when it's weakest. And what he means by that is it has to be weak. It has to have no teeth in order for it to be accepted by the nations in the world. Because if it had teeth and could actually really enforce things, uh, a number of nations, the United States included, would throw it off and be like, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> it's the same reason that the UN won't subscribe to the, um, to the international uh, court in The Hague. It's like, no, no, you're not going to tell us what we're going to do with our citizens. Um, and so they don't have power to enforce these things, but it has great value as a discussion, as a body that can discuss things. Now, there's a parallel there because the, in the American experience, <clears throat> and I know that about a third of my audience is American, a third of my audience is British or British Commonwealth, former states like Australia, C Canada, uh, or other English speaking. Uh, and some of you are just from Europe or other places. Um, so in the American experience, when the Americans rebelled against the British, who the British actually rebelled against their own constitution and the American understanding of this by doing things that they shouldn't be doing to the Americans, the Americans were appealing for the rights of Englishmen that were guaranteed to them in the constitution, the Magna Carta all the way forward. You can't make me build a bridge against my will or take my corn without paying for it. Look it up, it's in the Magna Carta or the charters that were set out for the colonists that went there. So they were saying, you know, we have these rights, these rights of Englishmen, and you can't take these away. And when you did, you abridged that. And so we are stepping away from you and starting our own thing. Now, when they did, they set up their own individual states. The United States is like saying United Nations. So these are, they, they made themselves their own nation, the nation of Massachusetts, the nation of Virginia, whatever. And then they came together into a almost UN kind of arrangement called the Articles of Confederacy or the Articles of Association first and the Articles of Confederacy. I taught history for a while while I was doing my graduate work um, at a little classical Christian school. Okay, so the Articles of Confederation were very loosely holding them together. Like we're all on the same page. Uh, as a unit against Britain, but you know you have your independence to do what you want to do in Massachusetts, while we in Virginia are doing something else. <clears throat> but the Articles of Confederation was great for holding them together against Britain, but it they it didn't really work in the same way that the UN doesn't work uh, when it came to like 
running the country, right? And so they scrapped that later on for the U.S. Constitution, 1787. I did my doctoral dissertation on the U.S. Constitution, the leadership assumptions of American statesmen during the Constitutional Convention and ratification debates. Um, that was my constitu- uh, That was my uh, dissertation title. Okay, and so the UN is very much like the the Articles of Confederacy that they had to scrap because it didn't have the power to regulate the whole system, and that's where the UN is. Now, there's another analogy that's really important. The UN is also uh, set up after World War II, and they put at the table a number of particular countries there as permanent members in the Security Council that were essentially the victors after World War II to kind of hold different interests together. And they're permanent members, so they're like mafia-made men. Like, you can't get, (coughs) excuse me, you can't get rid of them. I've been talking too much this week. You can't get rid of them. So as a made man, you just, they're, they're there. 